Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It is nice to have you here today. Hopefully you're in the right place. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the 2025 Privacy Roadmap and tackling the top privacy priorities that we need to for the upcoming year. So to get us started, a couple housekeeping items. For starters, uh, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A below. Hope you have your pen and paper or digital notebook handy. And Dave, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to move to the next screen so that we can introduce ourselves. Amazing. Thank you. So I am the chatty person here. My name is Jody Daniels. I'm CEO and privacy consultant at Red Clover Advisors. I'm really glad that you are here with us today. And we're also, I'm going to be asking for a little bit of uh, favors. It's been a little challenging in my neighborhood today with power. So we are hoping that this is going to go smoothly. If not, I know that uh, you're in great hands. So we are all things privacy consulting. We're all about the operational aspects of the long list of requirements we're going to talk about here today. And I am so delighted to have David Staus join us. So David, I'd love to turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, everybody. Thanks, Jody. Uh, thanks for having me, first off, on the webinar today. I'm Dave Staus. I am a uh, attorney, data privacy attorney in Denver, Colorado, and head up uh, Hush Blackwell's privacy practice and run a blog called Biteback Law, which I think most people are familiar with um, through LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking about some privacy law today. So to get started, we're going to have a quick poll question. We're only going to do one poll today, just to get a sense. While well, everyone is kind of joining, how prepared are you for these 2025 privacy laws? Awesome, you've got this, you feel super prepared. You're feeling pretty good, you're here to learn more today, or help, I am not prepared, and you are also here to learn more today. We'll give everyone just a few minutes. Get those last votes on in. All right, going once, going twice. Sold, let's see how everyone is. Okay, the major, oh, I love this. It's like the Pareto principle, 80-20. <laughs> Most of you are feeling really good and excited to keep learning. And uh, about 20% of you are in a needing to, to be prepared. And we have something for everyone today. So, oh, actually I didn't share the results. Now I've shared the results. Everyone can see, 80-20. So 80% of you are feeling good. Just about 20% of you need a little help. And, and that's all right, we're gonna work on it. So Dave, what is our agenda today? There we go. You want me to talk about the agenda or do you want to show it? You have to hit the slide. I think I advanced. Can you see that? Nope. Okay. Uh, I wonder if your polling question has... Need to oh, stop sharing. Reset. All right. Let's try. How about now? Yes, amazing. Here's how we're gonna set up our time today. We're going to talk about the patchwork of states and amendments, the key trends. What are some of the enforcement priorities? What do regulators care about? What can you actually do? And some discussion and questions. So we are going to do our best to get to some of those questions. Please do put them in the chat. And for whatever reason we're unable to do so, we will do our best to do a follow-up with them. So with that being said, our next slide is going to talk a little bit about why we should even care about privacy. So there are laws. The good first part is people tend to care about laws. So that's always good. But aside from just that, we also are all about building trust. And you can see that more than 70% of customers genuinely care about privacy. And they're making decisions with their wallet, whether they're B2B or B2C. They also care a lot about AI and we all know that there's an intersection between AI and privacy. Today, we're really gonna talk a lot about privacy. It's all about that outward facing privacy policy, those cookie experiences, if you might have it, identifying what's gonna happen inside. What are the privacy principles? Because we need principles to match to requirements. Then we actually have to build a program to make it all work. Ultimately, consumers have rights. So today we're going to talk about this roadmap as it intersects with the different requirements. Now, we have a map and some 
states. So if you are familiar with the IAPP map, that is great, but I want to make sure you're familiar with the awesome Hush Blackwell map as well. So this has an interactive map here. I just have the state privacy law, but they also have multiple other trackers and lucky you at the end of our slides, we also have a list of each one of those trackers. So go bookmark this page for after our webinar for you to keep coming back because they do an amazing job every year. And you can see here, yellow is all enacted. I wanna go to the next slide just so you can see sort of the time frame of look, we just had one little law a while ago. Then we're really building to a significant hockey stick effect in the US of a state privacy patchwork. Dave, anything you wanna add here? I know we wanna get right into our, our good friends in some of our states here. Uh, no, I, I think we'll focus on, you know, what's coming down the pike in, in 2025. I think one thing to talk about, this, this slide's helpful, I think, from a perspective of you can see what's coming, but we're not going to talk about every state that's on here. Some states just aren't like Tennessee, right? I mean, like it exists, it's there, but it's not going to move the needle for folks unless you're just covered by Tennessee and that's the first one you're covered by. So we're going to focus, and, and the slides are coming up on kind of the ones that are moving the needle, the nuances that that maybe you need to bake into your compliance program. So I think that you know Jody's slide here is is great because it does give you sort of that that general feel of what's coming. And the only thing I would say too is you know January first is when most state legislatures reopen for the year, or at least very soon thereafter. So this will grow um, in ways we can't foresee quite yet. Um, and then finally, just you know, this is state consumer data privacy laws. So don't forget that there are children's and we'll talk about those a little bit, biometric data privacy laws and, you know, amendments to existing privacy laws. So this gives you a window into where we're going, but, you know, it's one piece of the puzzle. There are multiple pieces. Very well said. My prediction is we're going to get over half the states in the next legislative season. And I'm, I'm not a gambler, so don't place any bets on that. But that's my guess. I think we're going to get over half. It's, uh, you know, predictions is dangerous business, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's my prediction. <laughs> nobody, nobody remembers when you're right with predictions. They only remember when you're wrong. There you go. I said it at 11, so I feel like I can say it now too. All right, take us away. Yeah, there was there were some folks that were predicting we would have a federal privacy law as soon as we got five states to pass privacy laws. No, right? see, I was in the camp that we weren't going to have that. So <laughs> if I follow on my own, I'm doing, I'm doing well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think... Um, I think pivoting and and getting into these nuances, I kind of foreshadowed this with with the last uh, slide, but you know, really want to kind of focus on, you know, if you're here and you've you've like you're in that eighty uh, percentage range or even a twenty that Jody showed with the prior poll, you're probably kind of wondering about like, hey, I've done a, a fair amount of this work. What what's coming down the pike that I really need to be concerned about? And and really, you know, it it, it starts with Maryland. It may end with Maryland. It certainly starts in Maryland. Um, and, and really to try to understand what Maryland did last year is, um, the, the, you know, the, the existing concept in privacy law is you, know, you put place a lot of burden on a consumer, right? And you place the burden on a consumer to exercise their rights, to opt out of, tr of tracking technologies and privacy advocates really got a hold of, um, uh, the Maryland legislature and got their attention last year. And, and tried something new in Maryland. And what they basically did was they said, you know, we want to put the onus on the company, not put the onus on the consumer, right? And you see that with this data minimization, this two-tier structure that they've they've rolled out in Maryland. And Maryland will go into effect later this year, or not, well, I'm sorry, later next year, October, 2025. And what they, they essentially didn't, I even feel like data minimization is a misnomer here, but we just don't have a better phraseology for it right now. A lot of us have talked about, you know, coming up with something new in this regard. They call it um, substantive data minimization, I've heard, being used. Um, but essentially what it ends up coming down to is with personal data. So there's sensitive data and there's personal data. With personal data, your collection needs to be reasonably necessary to provide the product or service uh, requested by the consumer, right? So your collection, I think that has significance, the word collection there. Um, so for example, right, like if you're selling a product online, it's reasonably necessary to collect things like an address if you have to ship it, credit card information if you have to pay for it, email address if you have to send a receipt, right? So that's necessary. Um, is it necessary to collect other things like social security number? Just throw a random thing out there. Of course not, right? To sell a product. 
Um, so they want to basically say like, there's only a burden on the consumer, uh, on the company to only be collecting what it needs. Now, what it doesn't say here, and what's kind of missing on this slide, is your processing activities then are buttressed by and, and, and boxed in by, I should say, the secondary purpose in the Maryland law. And so for the example there would be, you've collected that email address and uh, you know to, to provide a receipt. Well, can you use that for marketing purposes, right? Down the line to send emails to people saying, hey, would you like to buy other products and services? And that's really gonna be judged by uh, your privacy policy is basically how that, that connects together. The second part, I'm gonna go into this a little bit, um, a little bit uh, with the next slide as well is the sensitive data. And with sensitive data, what they've made it there is strictly necessary to provide a product or service. So the two tiers are regular personal data, reasonably necessary, sensitive data is strictly necessary. Okay, and let me kind of tease it out for you. So here two, four, if you're looking at this Washington Privacy Act model, so you know, and we know this already, right? Washington tries to pass the law, they don't, but the model that Ruben Carlisle developed has become adopted in Virginia, Colorado, Connecticut, and the like, as uh, juxtaposed from California. So the way that they've approached this is really like an Article 9 GDPR approach, which is if you have sensitive data, then you require consent. Uh, yeah, setting aside the fact that GDPR is a heightened uh, consent for it, but U.S. purposes, it's consent to collect sensitive data. Maryland said no. Maryland rejected this, and you can see this in the last slide I showed you, which is the strictly necessary uh, slide. But keep in mind, if you go through the bill and you go through like the, the red lines of the bill over time, they deleted the specific, it was at some point in time, it said consent or reasonably, or I'm sorry, consent or strictly necessary to process sensitive data. They deleted consent. That's significant. If you're familiar with uh, Washington's My Health, My Data Act, the standard there is consent or, or uh, necessary to provide a product or service. And Maryland went a step further and they just said it's strictly necessary to provide a product or service. Um, so there's a lot of people who are still, like notwithstanding that, trying to read a consent, uh, consent into it. Um, the language there that people tend to focus on is requested by the consumer, right? So if I've requested it, is that not consent? So some drafting, some ambiguity there, I think that we can work through the next year. That said, it is notable that there is an exception, a general exception to the entire law, which says that nothing in this subtitle, i.e. the law, may be construed to restrict the controller or processor's ability to provide a product or service specifically requested by the consumer. So you have, in one place, you have strictly necessary as standard, and then in the exemptions, you actually have it say uh, something different, right? <laughs> say nothing will. So I, I think this is one of these areas where like, Again, you're trying to take a new paradigm of data minimization and draft it on, and graft it onto a Washington Privacy Act model, and the, the lawmakers bluntly just didn't go through the entire statute and address everything, or entire bill and address everything. Um, we'll see if they come back to it this year. I don't know. The definition of sensitive data, um, fairly typical from what we've seen. I mean, this is sort of like the Connecticut model of definition. They have consumer health data in there. This is not the definition that we see, for example, like in New Jersey that has financial information. Uh, but it's a fairly standard one. And you know, we've we've done a lot of work, at least at Hush, about having like um charts on comparing the definitions of sensitive data. This is definitely one of these areas in these in these laws that people are aggressively trying to um expand. Um, you know, we often joke uh that you know pretty soon everything's gonna be sensitive data, right? Given how we just keep expanding the categories of, of sensitive data with these laws. And I'll talk a little bit about California later and what they're doing. Two more considerations um, on Maryland before I move on to Minnesota. Um, first one is, you know, if you remember in the previous slides, it talked about reasonably necessary or strictly necessary to provide a product or service, right? So the definition of product or service becomes important. And let me give you an example to try to, try to um, make this a little bit clearer. So we have our cell phones and we have like our financial services apps, right? And we often use um, fingerprints or eye scans to open those apps, right? It's a really great aspect of not having to remember your password is to use your fingerprint to open it. Um, biometrics data is sensitive data though, right? So biometrics data is, needs to be strictly necessary to provide the product or service. And so the question ultimately, ultimately becomes like, is your fingerprint scan strictly necessary to provide a product or service when you could use your password to provide that product or service uh, to open up that app, right? So that question becomes like really, you know, it, 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 you, know you just kind of think about it. You're like, well, why, why can't I use my, 
why can't I use my fingerprint, right? I want to use my fingerprint, right? Uh, and like, I'm voluntarily consenting to use my fingerprint. Is that enough? Well, keep in mind, again, we talked about the government, right? So what we start talking about to try to solve this problem, this legis legislative problem we've created is what is the product or service? If I define the product or service as the app and accessing the app, then the argument could be like, well, no, it's your password, right? But if I define a product or service as the use of biometrics for, for accessing the app, then you would say, well, of course, like the use of biometrics is in fact strictly necessary because you need to use biometrics to use the biometrics to open the app. So anyway, it becomes this sort of like phraseology issue, right? Um, and I think these are the things we're working through with clients now, and we're going to be working through with them over the next year on how to comply. And then finally, you know, the definitions are reasonably necessary and strictly necessary. There are no definitions of those. So um, I don't know right now how to distinguish between what's reasonably necessary and what's strictly necessary. Um, I don't, I, and I can't offer any better guidance on that. I wish we had some sort of definitions around that, um, but we don't. And that's just where we stand right now. Okay, so let me uh, move on. And I actually had one more slide. I thought I was done with Maryland, but the sensitive data, uh, the treatment of sensitive data for kids, minors data, um, you cannot sell sensitive data uh, under Maryland. And the definition of sale, keep in mind, though, it, it includes the consent aspect to sale. So if you get consent to sell sensitive data, then arguably that would be something that you could do um, subject to because you're relying upon the exemption. The miners data one, um, this is one area where they also expanded beyond what we typically see in these laws. And in particular, it's, it's under 18. So it's a higher age threshold than, than, for example, Connecticut under 16. Although in the Kids Act SB3, they, they went up to under 18. Uh, but, you know, these states have been moving around with the age requirements. What they really did in Maryland, which, which is of note, you can see it in, in the last sentence there. It's a new or should have known standard. So the typical one has been actual knowledge. The standard's been actual knowledge or it's been actual knowledge or willful disregard, right? And willful disregard is an intent-based standard. You know, I am willfully disregarding it. Should have known is a much different standard. It is potentially a duty to inquire, right? I think you run into First Amendment issues as well. But again, one of those ways that, you know, we're going to have to work through with people with Maryland. Okay. Let's move the map to another M state, Minnesota. Um, interesting bill. This is Representative Elkins' bill. He took a number of years. Representative Elkins is interesting because, you know, Representative Elkins was one of the first um, state lawmakers to grab the Washington Privacy Act model law and try to pass it. And it took a number of years uh, for Steve to eventually get it across the finish line here. But over time, he continually worked on it, right? He's done a lot of unique things here that I think are really interesting. In particular, I think, Jody, I think you'll find a few of these things interesting with respect to like your later slides here. So first off, he integrated organs, you know, that right to provide a, a list of specific third parties. He also has the financial institution. He, he mirrored that that organ has. So organ doesn't give, organ gives an entity level exemption to financial institutions, but it uses its state law definition of financial institutions, not the GLBA definition. I, I can go into it, but I don't think we need to right now. Um, so anyway, so he tracks Oregon's law in those two respects. Um, and he's also the first state to statutorily say that in response to a request to access, you don't have to turn over things that are subject to the state data breach notification statute, driver's licenses, social security numbers, those types of things, right? And the concept there is basically like, if I make a request to access, do I really need that company to, to, to give me my social security number, should I not have my social security number? But what the company needs to say is, I have your social security number, right? So you don't have to turn it over because then it's just right for data breach issues, right? But they have to tell you, I have your social security number. California and Colorado did this through regulation. Minnesota is the first state to do this through statute. Profiling is a very interesting aspect as well. It's a big deal that Representative Elkins had. He, he was really trying to look at the FCRA and try to figure out a way to make the profiling a little bit more robust than we've seen in existing uh, state, state laws. Um, keep in mind, we're going to see this as well, work through with the uh, automated decision-making technology regulations in California. We'll touch about them, talk, touch on them just for a second later in, in the uh, hour. Um, but what Representative Elkins wanted to do was basically, you know, create this aspect, like it, the, the right to question the profiling, right? Be informed of the reason for the profiling and if feasible, be informed of what actions they can take to secure a different decision, right? So if you're familiar, and Jody mentioned AI laws, right? And we see this blending of privacy and AI, right? Because it's data governance at the end of the day. And so we see this blending and you might be thinking about like, well, that sounds familiar to me. And you might be thinking that's similar to Colorado AI Act, right? And this idea of like, hey, you can opt out of, or you have the right to appeal, I should say, in Colorado, the right to appeal um, 
a decision using automated technology, artificial intelligence systems. If it's a consequential decision, it has to be something like financial services, lending, housing, education, those types of things, right? So Representative Elkins was trying to graph this onto and, and make a more robust profiling opt-out right in Minnesota than existed before. What I'll say, though, is that Minnesota still has all exemptions in place, right? So it has to be a consequential decision, right? So it has to be financial services and lending and housing and all those types of things. And the issue that the right to opt out of profiling is always in these state privacy laws is the very things that are consequential decisions tend to be exempt from the laws, right? So financial institutions like GLBA financial institutions are the ones making financial decisions, right? But they're exempt under many state laws under GLBA data and entity level exemptions. So Minnesota still has this issue here where we I, I, we've seen how far this will go. Okay, I think I beat that one to a pulp. Um, privacy program requirements. This is the one I think you know the, the big wind up for Jody, right? Um, first state to require data inventories. So Jody's got a slide later. <laughs> She's going to talk to you about data inventories. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what though. This is in the draft California regulations as well, the cybersecurity audit regulations. So first, but you know, the, the avalanche may be coming. Uh, data retention, first state to actually um, require getting rid of data that's not reasonably necessary. And this documentation as well, this concept of like um, maintaining description of the policies and procedures the control, controller has adopted to comply and there's a list of requirements, right? So basically what this is functionally requiring you to do in Minnesota is have a privacy program at the end of the day. That's functionally what it's made requiring you to do. I would encourage you to take a look at the law. Um, it's hard to put on a slide everywhere, you know, all the requirements that are there, but basically they're, they're telling you like you need to have a privacy program. Rhode Island, I, you know, what happened in Rhode Island? Um, so functionally what happened in Rhode Island was that they've had two competing bills for a number of years. And what they decided to do, my take on it, they decided to combine the two bills, right? But they didn't go back into the definitions and, and rework the definitions, right? So you've got basically like a Washington Privacy Act model that's missing a lot of the pieces like data protection assessments and those types of things. But then you've got this first section of the bill that applies more broadly and requires you to have like a privacy policy and it applies to like, you know, like CalAPA applies, right? Which is any business doing business in the state. And then the interesting aspect of it, um, of this is that, and it says here, among other things, you must identify in your privacy policy, all third parties to whom you have sold or may sell consumers personally identifiable information. Well, the idea that you have to identify who you may sell stuff to in the future is complicated, um, hard to say, right? Uh, and it's the third parties, right? Not categories, it's the third parties. And making matters even more complicated is the statute does not define personally identifiable information. It defines, I believe, personal data. Um, if you go back to the, the bill structure there, uh, one of the things you can look at is like the definitions from before. And I think what the idea was, was basically like this was supposed to be a data breach notification definition of PII. Uh, so name plus social, name plus driver's license. Um, but anyway, it, it is what it is right now. I don't know if there might be a legislative fix before this goes into effect, but beware of Rhode Island. New Jersey, my home state, I live in Denver now, but this is where I grew up. Um, so I can say whatever I want about the Jer New Jersey law, and I've got home state rights to it, I suppose. Um, I mentioned this before, financial information. Uh, they've expanded the definition of sensitive data to include financial information. What, what I will say is when you look at the statute, um, I, I don't know what the intent was or not. I wasn't in the room for this, but what it says is financial information, including, and then it goes on to state things like, you know, financial account number with password, right? But, so where, where I've seen this interpreted is that people have said like, well, really what it's covering is um, your account number if they've got your password, right? I encourage you to look at it, though, and to look at the definition, because, again, it says financial information, including. And so that what I think you could read that as is you could say it's all financial information and that financial information includes the type of stuff that's under data breach notification statutes, but it's financial information in general. Um, there's been, I think, the next one, there's been a threat of rulemaking, I think is what I can best describe it as right now. Um, so maybe we get some clarification around this issue, but it's one of those things where I just think it's, you know, I encourage you to take a look at it. Don't take my word for it, but to look at this thing and financial information, it's a new category, right? I mean, the CCPA covers financial information in a different way. Um, uh, but again, that's a, that's, that's a right to limit 
the use of sensitive personal information is not the consent-based approach to, to sensitive information under the uh, Washington Privacy Act. Um, rulemaking, I mentioned that before, this, this law goes into effect January 15th. Um, in theory, they're supposed to be doing rulemaking. There was some noise that like maybe they're working on rulemaking. We've seen nothing. I don't pretend to be an expert on the rulemaking process under New Jersey statutory law, administrative law. Um, what we've seen in other states is like there's an opportunity for comment from the public on rulemaking. I I would, I mean, I'm I'm pure speculating, but I would expect that to exist in New Jersey, but I don't know. Uh, but you know, it's November 20th and it goes into effect January 15th. And I mean, usually what happens is when I'm saying things like this on a webinar, it's like in the middle of like them publishing the rules, right? At that time. And I, you know, I'm wrong immediately as I say it. Um, but we're waiting to see. So we'll see where it goes. Um, anyway, you know, it applies to nonprofits. There's no covered entity exemption. So a no FERPA exemption. So a lot of things that are kind of unique with Jersey. Also to the exemptions to sale with New Jersey, they, it does not include, so you, know, you have these definitions of sale, right? Transfer of personal information for monetary or, or uh, other value consideration. Then you have the exemptions, right? And the, New Jersey is missing the exemption um, of, and I've got it quoted here, the disclosure of personal data where the consumer directs the controller to disclose it or intentionally interact with third party consent, right? This idea of consent. And so Jersey is missing this in its, exempt, its exemptions here. Um, really interesting issue about how to kind of work this through. So, you know, pr privacy policy, you've got to notify of material changes there. These these aspects, I think, are coming, but it was sort of unique when it passed. And then the children's aspect here, that 13 to 17. But it's, again, I mentioned before, like the actual knowledge or willful disregard. So it uses that standard, not like the Maryland standard of should have known. All right, the rest here. Uh, well, I've got the rest and I've got Delaware. Um, I, you know, these are the ones I don't... I. I Kentucky is a Virginia copycat. Nebraska is a Texas copycat. New Hampshire is a Connecticut copycat. And I think that's all I really need to say about those things. I mean, these are laws we know they're not moving the needle in any respect. Delaware, um, coming down the pike, January 1st. Um, if you're thinking like, what do I need to do? It does have a new right, um, sort of. The consumers contain a list of categories of third parties to which personal data was disclosed. Keep in mind that Oregon requires the... Um, they can obtain the third parties, right? Not the categories. It's the actual list of third parties. So a different tweak, a different variation on this one. Um, and something I think that already exists in California. I might be wrong about that. But um, anyway, it's worth taking a look at your privacy policy. Uh, it does apply to nonprofits. This used to be something that was a huge debate in um, uh, when Colorado passed the Colorado Privacy Act. The, the idea that nonprofits were going to be covered by that was a huge fight. But now you see state after state like Oregon and New Jersey and Delaware, covering nonprofits. I expect this, this trend to continue. I expect other states to amend their, their laws and, and to cover nonprofits. Um, and then, you know, this expansive definition of sensitive data, they added transgender or non-binary. I think that's or the origin there is Oregon, I think was the first state to do that and Delaware joined. They, they also, too, I'll mention, we haven't talked about applicability thresholds. We've got all those charts. If you need them, you know, we can, we can grab them. I'm sure Jody has them. I've got them as well. Delaware's 35,000. So it's a lower number. And Maryland, I really missed the ball on this one, but Maryland is is 35,000 as well. So it's a really low threshold number for Maryland. So these are laws that, you know, at least Maryland, I mean, Delaware is not a big state, but Maryland, you know, it's a really low threshold for, for applicability there. And it's all B2C too. I should say all these laws are B2C. California remains the only one to do B2B and employee data. Okay, mercifully, Jody, I get to welcome Jody <laughs> back in here and stop talking for a little while. It is all good. Um, there's a couple different questions in the Q&A, Dave, if you want to take a look and maybe if any of them are quick answers, that might be a, a great idea. So as you can tell, there are a few different nuances that each of these states need to address. And I know one of the questions was, how are companies addressing different ages for kids? We see that whether it's different rights by state, different uh, ages for kids, all of them have these nuances. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how to address them. This is our proprietary framework of how we think about privacy programs. So we essentially take the different requirements from all those 14 different charts, and we organize them by these different categories. So we're very excited, for example, that Minnesota believes you should have a data inventory, and maybe California will, will join the party because it's, in our mind, you need a data inventory to be able to have an effective privacy notice. You need the data inventory to know where the rights are because how do you provide the categories if you don't know what you have? Data inventories often fuel, when do I need to do a privacy impact assessment? Which new vendors do I have to be able to evaluate from a third-party risk management perspective? 
We're going to go through a couple of these areas here today. So Dave, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Awesome. Date inventories, they really are so much fun. I hope all of you love date inventories as much as we do. It's all about locating the data. And, you know, a lot of times companies will kind of look at, uh, I'm going to get a tech solution. And it's just going to find all my data and I'm done. Well, we believe that tech is helpful. It might help you find the data. We need to understand how data is used. We need to know personal and sensitive. And as we've just talked about, some states have different definitions of sensitive data. This also comes into play, I just wanted to share. So Dave, when you were talking about financial information in New Jersey, this actually shows up a lot in security policies. A lot of companies already say financial information is sensitive. From a privacy point of view, it isn't necessarily always the same. And we often see a big disconnect between the data classification that companies started with from a security point of view and what they actually need to be thinking about from a privacy point of view. These data inventories really help flag and highlight that. Then you can actually start understanding what are you processing? How are you collecting it? How are you using it? How are we going to make those determinations at Maryland if we literally don't know at a very minutia business process level, is it reasonably necessary? Is it strictly necessary? You have to get down to that business process level. We need to understand whether you call them systems, assets, vendors, all of it. Who are those people? What are they storing? I was just on a call earlier this morning. They are collecting. They are keeping it forever. So um, that particular company needs some retention help. Maybe they shouldn't be keeping everything that they're collecting forever. And they need to also understand who are these companies? And if it went to that third party, what is that third party doing with that data? In this particular company's situation, they did not even have a centralized process for managing the contracts. You can imagine privacy obligations might not be covered in those contracts. When you go through locating your data, understanding those ind individual business processes you're, and the different places where all that data is stored, you're able to start making evaluations of, do I have privacy risks? Do I need to adjust any policies? Um, do I need to do a privacy impact assessment? Is this sensitive data? Is this kids data? And you might have to make some different decisions. I love me a good data inventory. I think I'm gonna keep talking about data inventories on my next slide. Yes. So you need to think about how are you going to conduct this? The right answer is the one that's going to actually work in your company. Sometimes small companies have a lot of value from some type of technology tool. I've seen really large revenue-based companies do just fine on Excel because they don't have high volume of, of data. It really is, there's pros and cons to both approaches. Manual comes with all the Cons of an Excel spreadsheet, right? It, it doesn't always have, it's hard to maintain. It's only as accurate as the person providing the information, but it also might be a great starting point if you're not doing anything. Dave, I think you and I once did a panel together and we had someone in the room overwhelmed by where to start. And our suggestion was just get started, get started somewhere because that is better than finding the perfect solution. As you start to move up, there's some semi-automated tools. This is really where assessments come in. You can store information, report on it. It's still based on human interviews. So the inaccuracy is still there. However, it's a lot easier to conduct. And this also might be a great place to start or depending on the kind of data you have, a, a good place for quite a while. Where I think we're ultimately going to go and for some companies who have a pretty sophisticated uh, tool set, you have the teams in place to be able to do this, and also the budget is automated data discovery. This is where you're able to take an outside privacy tool, connect it to your tools today, and be able to identify what data elements you have in which systems. I will still offer that even in an automated data discovery, you still have to have the human piece to figure out that why and how the data is actually processed. So from an accuracy perspective, automation might be great. It is not fully automated where you can just put the privacy people out to lunch and we don't need to worry about it anymore. We still have to understand those business processes and line up everything that we've just talked about in all these different states. Let's chat a little bit about privacy impact assessments. So some of the states are going to require them. Some states are trying to still figure out how we do them. 
And oftentimes the data inventory helps identify where the sensitive information is, where the high risk information is. And sometimes people aren't really sure where to get started. We, we firmly believe create a policy and it's also a short list of questions. We like to call them privacy threshold assessments. This could be a Google sheet. Uh, I've seen them done as short forms in OneTrust. I've seen them just asked as questions in a project management review. Somewhere you need to be able to have a policy that says before my new initiative, before my new marketing campaign, before my new product rolls out, I need to ask a set of questions and that set of questions is going to trigger, do I need to have a deeper privacy impact assessment? That's what we do during the year. When we have our data inventory, we're able to help identify, oh wait, we need to do a privacy impact assessment and that might be part of my policy. These need to be documented. We have a state, Minnesota, trying to tell us you actually are gonna have to start documenting what your program is because otherwise it's just a he said, she said in a lovely virtual conference room or maybe real conference room somewhere. Then you actually have to conduct the assessments and the same exact approach applies for data inventory, manual, semi-automated. Um, some of the automated tools are trying to help you with this documentation. It still requires the whole point of these. You have to manage the risk. You have to flag the risk and review the risk and determine what are you going to do to mitigate it? Because that's the point, identify the risk and try and mitigate and determine what the next step is. And then this has to be maintained and ongoing. So if whomever creates the process goes on vacation, takes a different role, who's going to be able to help step in and fulfill that? That training element's really important for either how to conduct them or what to be looking for and how to mitigate them. Jody, can, can I jump in and make one, Absolutely. one observation here? So uh, I mentioned before the CCPA, they're engaging in, in new rulemaking. They got authority couple of Fridays ago to initiate the formal rulemaking process. It's a process, right? I mean, they're going to have to initiate formal rulemaking, get comments, revisions, the whole bit. This is not happening tomorrow, right? But it's happening. One of them now that's on point here is they're, they're going to do risk assessments, right? And you mentioned before, like, you know, Minnesota, I mean, all the states require risk assessments with respect to a certain a certain number of activities, right? Those exist now, and even the children's one have uh, exist now for you know Colorado uh, for Connecticut uh, to do a risk assessment, uh, and even in like the the Maryland Kids Code, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, what California is, is unique, and this is draft, and it could change, but it's what's unique is there is currently a requirement in the risk assessment regulations that you would have to file something with the California Privacy Protection Agency on a yearly basis that says you have done the risk assessments, right? That's a game changer if it happens. Like, that's not like, hey, we can kind of like get by without it. Like, that is a reporting obligation to notify, to have a short form uh, submission to the agency. I don't know whether that's going to make it to the final regulations, but it exists there now. And everything's Jody's just saying about doing these things can be something that like you have to do right at the end of the day. It's not a, it's not of like, well, it's a, it's a, you know, obligation. I think that's why they're really pushing for it. Sorry for it makes a lot of sense. It's trying to get companies to actually do the things that they're requiring because otherwise it's just a check mark that someone says that they did it. All right, what's next? Oh, my favorite. Um, so if you've been to any of my webinars, I just, oh, I love this one. So it's basically, you need a notice that actually says what you're doing. And then equally important is do what you say. Drafting the notice, you need that data inventory to be able to make sure it's accurate. As you go through your year and the business teams are trying to do new and cool and interesting things, it is essential that the privacy notice be reviewed to make sure that it can go forward. I recently had an example, marketing team wanted to move forward with a particular activity. It was not adequately covered in the privacy notice. Thankfully, they reviewed first, to be able to determine what next steps they needed to do to be able to carry on that marketing activity. So our next slide is, you know, there's a lot of new laws. Make sure you're aware of the laws that are going to be in scope for you and think about, what does that look like? A lot of times people are trying to do different regions, do different states, do different paragraphs. Um, you know, how are you going to maintain all of them? Dave mentioned CCPA is still the only state right now that covers employee notices. If you're global, you also need to consider those. So don't forget about them. They And kind of schedule. When are you going to do your annual notice and your ongoing checks throughout the year? And, and I'd love to just do a, a little bit of a plug 
make it legible and actually easy to read. It, it, Pop-ups that are hard, they're just all smushed together, not very enticing. This is where I think you have a big opportunity to work with your marketing team and your website team. Use visuals like we're doing here. Make hyperlinks. Use subtitles. I'm seeing a movement to summary sections and then to the full notice. So don't make it just that link that's in the footer. Make it actually a legible and easy to understand notice. Uh, quickly here, cookies. The whole point here is you might have a cookie consent solution and maybe you got it up and running. Things change, tech breaks, websites change, new pixels are added. You wanna have a way to do an audit. You wanna be able to know which laws apply. Do you have a consent solution that's going to work? Are you moving forward with a banner? Do you have it in place properly? Is it actually working? Because if I hit reject, it actually needs to not fire any further. So do some type of audit. It is very dependent on your brand and how many pixels you have in your particular setup. What I would offer is this is not a set and forget. And we see a lot of issues where that happens and something breaks along the way, they think it's working and then actually it is not. There's an entire other universe of pixel litigation. That's a whole nother webinar, but the cookie piece, just having a plan, again, a policy, a plan, a regular schedule, is going to be essential. And this should also be part of your data inventories. When we do data inventories, we always make sure we're covering targeted advertising, digital analytics, because you need to be able to understand, could sale of data fall through here? What is the use case? Are you taking personal information and sharing it with outside vendors that might also be able to retarget a campaign? All of that is kind of part of this cookie experience. Good, if I, if I may interject again, just, just a bookmark, New York Attorney General's office issued guidance on cookies over the summer. Uh, what makes it interesting is New York doesn't actually have a consumer data privacy law, right? Uh, but they nonetheless issued um, guidance on like what cookie pop-ups should look like and things around like dark patterns and those types of things. So what Jody was just saying, it's so important because it's not just a matter of like, I've got it up there. Like it's got to work right, right? It's got to like do what it's supposed to do. It's got to do things like when I hit reject, like, it, it should reject cookies, right? It should take those off. And these are things that Jody does. You know, I, we've worked on clients together in the past. Like Jody does this. This is what her, her outfit. Jody does a lot of things, but this is what her outfit does. Uh, one of the pieces that they do. And it's one of these like really easy things for regulators. We talked about like regulatory enforcement in the beginning slides. It's really one of these things for regulators to really focus on, right? Which is when I show up on your website, you know, if I decline, does it actually take the cookies off, right? Does it take the right cookies off or the ones that are remaining on there? Um, those types of things like, you know, I have an X on my cookie banner. Like, what, what does the X do? What does that say, right? To me, X is reject. Like, if I have a reject all and I have an X, then the X is the same thing, right? But if your X is just like it goes away and, and you're you're interpreting that as acceptance or something along those lines, but you have an accept all button, like these are these dark pattern issues, right? And so like working through these things, it's like really easy to go back to your company's website today if you've got a banner and say like, does this make sense? Is this doing what it's supposed to be doing? And if it doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't make sense to a regulator. And it's a really low hanging fruit for, for regulators. Sorry, Jody, go ahead. I'll, I'll no, excellent. Start. Thank you. No, I'm good. You can keep going. So when it comes to privacy rights process and policy, this is one where I see a lot of companies go and procure software and then think the software is just going to solve it. But you actually need to identify a process to make the software work. And someone needs to, sometimes software is used for full automation. Sometimes it's used just kind of in the middle as a, a workflow and a repository. You have to identify how are you going to honor rights? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I have no rights. What do you do about me? You need to make decisions, these types of decisions. That is part of the workflow. That is part of the policy. So it is essential to really be thoughtful to what states are you in scope for? What can you operationally handle if you choose to offer them across the board? How will you set this up? Who will be responsible? California requires training relevant employees, but beyond just that, truly, who is going to make sure in your company that they're actually looking at the mailbox or looking at the requests or looking at new solutions that you have, new assets, new vendors that might need to get added to the automation that you perhaps set up? Or perhaps you're doing something different in that use case and you need to be able to manage it because remember in our data inventory, that's where we would have identified that. 
training people and having a way to be able to pull all of this together is part of the program. That's so important. I think we may have lost Jody for a second, but I think maybe Jody, I'll just take over and I actually have the next slide. So Jody was having some power issues, so maybe she'd be jumping back on. Um, I wanted to flag as the next module is the privacy law amendments, right? So it's not just the laws that are getting passed right now. It's also the laws that are getting updated. So California, for updates to the CCPA this past year, um, Kind of the ones I find I think are are really kind of interesting on this right is uh, the addition of neural data to the categories of sensitive information. Colorado is the first state to add neural data to its uh, definition of sensitive information, um, but uh, California was a quick follow. Uh, Colorado kind of screwed it up right because they made it neural data when it is being used to personally to identify an individual right, but you don't really use your brain waves to identify. Well, so it got a little bit botched up in the drafting process there. California did not pursue that route. They actually got it right, neural data. Um, but again, it's kind of like a nuanced area, right? How much companies are collecting neural data. But again, it just kind of shows to me this ex ever expanding definition of sensitive data. Um, and AB 1008 there, I think is interesting too. There's a number of AI bills. We've tracked them in other locations on the blog and LinkedIn and stuff like that that passed. Um, but 1008 told you that personal information can exist in a variety of formats, including AI systems. There's been a lot of debate about, you know, whether AI systems hold personal data or not. And again, we see this blending of, of you know, apparently all privacy lawyers all have to, and privacy professionals, I should say, all have to upskill very quickly <laughs> into AI. Europe, Europe had a very easy path, right? Europe had a number of years to do GDPR, and then we are still trying to do the state privacy law stuff. And we're being thrown into the fire of AI as well. But this is one of these areas where you do see this, this overlap or this being uh, amended to recognize that personal data can exist in AI systems. I don't I don't read it to say it does exist in AI systems. I think there's a big debate there, um, but it is what it is. Okay, so, oh, and actually 3286, this is really flown under the radar. I made a big deal about this in a webinar I did recently. And, and what I basically said was, they're going to change the monetary threshold for, for California. It's, it's 25 million annual gross revenue. We've known that for years. Now they've made it basically up to the agency. So the agency is going to be, be able to push based on the consumer um, index, consumer price index, is going to say like what that threshold should be. So I think reading the tea leaves, we'll see that go up. That might be relevant to companies, may not be relevant to companies. Um but something worth kind of keeping in mind, like that 25 million is is going to change. Okay, Colorado, and I'll kind of cut to the chase through these. I know we're short on getting short on time. Colorado had three different bills that passed, in addition to the Colorado AI Act, uh, which they passed. They also passed, uh, which is a biometric privacy amendment to the Colorado Privacy Act. Uh, that's July of this year. And it, that is, we mentioned before about employees, right? And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't note, this is in which Colorado has extended the Colorado Privacy Act into employee data, a very, very small incremental <laughs> extension into employee data. I wonder if it's, you know, two, three years from now and you're still listening to me on these topics, right, about whether other states have followed suit and sort of extended into employee data in certain aspects like biometric information. So anyway, uh, that one's coming. It's 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 July 1st, 2025, um, worth taking a look at. Children's data. So Connecticut passed SB3, the, the privacy amendment to the CTDPA uh, two years ago. Uh, and Senator Rodriguez um, took that, basically mm -hmm. took that SB41 and, and grafted that onto the Colorado Privacy Act. So Colorado and Connecticut are aligned there. And the biological data one, I mentioned that before, that's a neural data one, um, but it must be used to identify individuals. So I already went in. Okay. Virginia, New Hampshire, uh, Virginia did amend it with some children's stuff. They added additional provisions with respect, to, but they, listen, it, in my opinion, it does anything. And the reason why it didn't do anything is because it kept the age at, at under 13 and under 13 is already parental consent. So you're basically saying like, you need parental consent. You have to do some, other, I just don't think it moves in at all. Uh, others may disagree. New Hampshire, and actually, in fact, the governor vetoed it saying it should be under 18 and then the legislature overrode it and said it was under 13. So anyway, New Hampshire, they passed their law and then they went back and amended it. Uh, basically, they took out the provisions that required the secretary of state to conduct rulemaking on various issues. I think this is one of those buyers regret, right? So 
they passed it and the Secretary of State said, come again? What what am I supposed to do here? <laughs> right? Are you supposed to do rulemaking? Ah, you know, let's 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 figure out a way to amend the law. Let's take a pass on that one. So anyway, they went back in there um and they got rid of that aspect there. CPPA rulemaking, I foreshadowed this before. So um listen, it it's it's as drafted, it's a big deal. I, I don't want to you know, sound like the boy who cried wolf. It's a big deal. Cybersecurity audits are going to apply broadly and require a ton. Written certifications to the AG's office. Risk assessments, we talked about those before, having to like notify the AG's office. Uh, automated decision-making technology, that was the one at the board meeting a couple of weeks ago that received a ton of pushback from business interest. This is AI, right, type stuff. And that's why, you know, the the startups, the venture capital, uh, the business community thing is too much, is too much, is too much. You heard guys like McTaggart uh, on the board member, Alistair McTaggart, say it's too much and we need to walk this back. And they're also revising the existing CCP regulations to make changes to it. Um, these are drafts. They will change. They will go through comment periods, um, but they got to be on your radar. They just have to be. And a lot of things Jody was talking about before, if these things pass even close to what they, they state now, they're going to require a lot of the things that Jody was talking about before, data inventory, assessments, um, and require you to, to tell the agency that you've actually done these things and have board member, at least for cybersecurity audits, have like board level uh, individual signing written certification saying this was done. If you're familiar with the New York Division of Financial Services, cybersecurity regulations, it's a very similar aspect with respect to cybersecurity audits. What I'll say is we just, and this would be a shameless plug, but we just did a series of four on-demand webinars on bitebacklaw.com. You can find them. You can follow me on LinkedIn. They're on YouTube. They're like 15 to 20 minutes on four topics. We didn't do insurance regulations because it's just one page, uh, but we did the other four. I encourage you to take a look at those if they're of interest to you. All right, children's privacy law. I'll try to get through this quickly, Joe, so you have time for your big finish here. Uh, Maryland's kids code. So Maryland passed not only consumer data privacy law, they also passed the kids code. Um, this I, this was like an AADC uh, variant, um, an age-appropriate design code act variant that obviously got struck down in California as unconstitutional. Uh, Maryland was using that, but they made a number of revisions to it. Um, and it kind of looks more similar to, I would say, like the Connecticut model now with some changes um, you know, applicability, it's going to occur entities that develop uh, products, so on online products, they're accessible by by children. And it's got this like this covered entity aspect. It's, it feels a lot like California, right, with this threshold, a revenue threshold or, um, you know, number of consumers threshold or basically your data broker. Right. So it apply, it'll apply broadly. Um, and there's a number of requirements in there. I won't, you know, in the interest of time, I won't go into all of these, but you're going to have processing restrictions. Like what can you do with the data? I mentioned before, you have to do data protection assessments. That's also something that's required in Connecticut and will be required in Colorado when that goes into effect for mm -hmm. kids, like heightened risk of harm to, to minors. Um, and what bleeds through this as well, right, is this concept of best interest of the child in a mind term in Maryland. And you have to basically make sure that your processing activities are in the best interest of the child. There's an hour I could talk about these issues of like who gets to decide what's in the best interest of the child, parents, the kid the state, the company, right? These different pillars and how these things change over time, right? Like what if, who gets to decide what's in the best interest of a child for a four-year-old is much different than a 17-year-old, right? Um, anyway, so you have to configure privacy settings to the highest level of privacy, provide your information in a way that's accessible to children, suitable to their age, and provide prominent tools uh, to exercise privacy rights. If you're subject to it, it's already in effect. Um, if you think you're subject to it, then yeah, it's time to get going on this one. New York Child Data Act, I think this is my last slide, um, so I'll just kind of get through this quickly and shoot it over to you, Jody. Um, this is a big one. Um, June 20th next year, uh, this age, so strictly necessary or consent, right? We talked about this with Marilyn before. So basically, your, your processing activities, and this is for under 18, either have to be strictly necessary for the specific activities or you, you obtain consent, right? So again, here we have consent, where Marilyn, we did not have consent. Age signals is a really fascinating thing. You familiar with the global privacy control signal? Should be basically sends a signal when opt out of tracking technologies on a website, right? We download it as a browser extension. What New York is telling you is websites that are covered by this law are going to have to recognize an age signal. So the the browser extension will, in theory, tell you that the person is under eighteen years old. It doesn't exist yet. Right. I mean, this is one of those like, 
well, we're going to legislate it and we're going to kind of hope it works. And there's also no, there's no structure around like how this would work and how companies would recognize it. Right. So for example, like say a 45 year old man in Denver wants to say he's a 16 year old boy in Denver. Right. And I just use like a browser signal to say that, to opt out, like there, there's no structure. Around, right. And so there's some stuff that needs to be done here. There's rulemaking as well. But this is really one of those aspects where New York has, has really done a lot here. There's a second bill they passed, which was the Algorithms Act, which applies to social media companies. This one applies more broadly. Okay, Jody, I will leave you to the last five minutes here. Amazing. So one more. Thank you. I've mentioned pre uh, training earlier. There are a lot of different pieces here. So one of the other big areas that we are a big believers in is, is training. So there's just general privacy training. We talk to a lot of companies and they might have procured a provider. They do a great job for security training. Don't forget the privacy training. And then how do you make this come to life? It's with role-based training. Think about if you have uh, you know, your employees for HR, the marketing team, what does product and engineering really need to know about each one of these laws and how does it apply directly to what they're doing? What about privacy rights? Customer support, Jody complains. I tell the customer support person, hey, I, I want my data to be deleted. Does that person know what to do? Privacy rights can come from a variety of different places. When do I know how to conduct a data inventory or raise my hand for a privacy impact assessment? Training needs to happen for that as well. And I mentioned security. Next slide, kindly. So I kind of started this with all about trust. There are regulators, there are fines, there are rules, there are reasons that people and companies should be adhering to privacy. I firmly believe it is about trust. It's I, I wrote a book on trust, Data Reimagine, Building Trust, One Bite at a Time, because at the end of the day, it is people who are making the purchase decisions. All of us are working for companies and companies are trying to sell things to people. People are still making decisions. And the people and the businesses, I see this time and again, where sales are stopped, whether it's B2C, definitely in the B2B space, because the company is not able to show that they care and have what is necessary for privacy and security. So being able to train all those teams and help explain how privacy and complying actually helps the sales process is a win-win and helps the end user and privacy teams. So I think the next one's gonna wrap us all up together. So steps to compliance, just kind of reiterate, you need those data inventories. The data inventories are gonna help you flag when you need to do those assessments. You have to maintain those notices, including internal policies as well. Create a plan for your cookie governance and software review. Have a policy, a process, and an approach for privacy rights. Continue with ongoing training. And once you did it all, you have got to figure out how you rinse and repeat and make it work for the future. We have a number of different amazing materials on our next slides. So we love privacy ops. And we have a long list of available resources for you, including a brand new 2025 US state privacy checklist that you can grab. All of these are complimentary, so off you go and grab them. And on the next slide, I want to make sure that I am highlighting, and, and Dave, actually, why don't you take this one and talk about all of your amazing trackers that you have? And this is just a short list, people. There was only like one slide, and Dave has so much mm -hmm. amazing content. Um, yeah, thanks, Jody. I, um... So these are, you know, we, we, we've been tracking, gosh, we, I started years ago with, with just the far left one, the state privacy law tracker uh, back when when it was just Virginia that was running bills. Uh, and we've done it every year. We'll do it again. We'll do the 2025. I'll spend my nights and weekends tracking privacy bills and we'll do, uh, we'll roll that one out starting in January. But this is the one for 2024. Over the years, we've added the biometrics and the children's privacy law ones as well. Um and last year we added the AI one. Um, we're gonna, I'm hoping, I'm optimistic actually, we're gonna roll out uh, something kind of special for AI this year, tracking, because it, you know, I'm not sure if you tracked and Jay, maybe you have, but like there was something like 500 bills filed dealing with AI at the state level last year. And they ranged anywhere from like algorithmic discrimination bills <laughs> to things like deep fakes and those types of things. And it's, it's chaos is basically what it is. So we're hearing a lot of clients who are really struggling with trying to understand and separate the wheat from the chaff. And so we're, we're in the process of trying to solve that problem for people and, and get them something that they, that, that'll hopefully cut through it. So anyway, stay tuned on that one. And I will turn it over, back over to you, Jody. I, we're probably out of time for questions. So maybe I should just probably go. not. One more, though, so that we have our content, uh, our contact information. 
We are both super active on LinkedIn. Come follow us. We would love to connect and chat privacy all day long. Please visit the Hush Blackwell site. There, the, the bite back blog, the different trackers on our site. We have all those downloadable resources. We also have the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Dave was an amazing guest on. And Dave, we are so grateful that you came today to join us in this uh, ridiculous amount of privacy laws that are coming next year. So much information to try and pack in in this one hour session. Truly grateful for you. Thank you to everyone who came and joined and listened. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Jody.